So I come from an Italian family, and I think best in the language of food. I'm also a teacher, so you could think of my job as the feeding of information to my students. But very recently, I had an experience that made me think, I think the way I've been preparing the meals has been all wrong. As a high school biology teacher, my practice begins with the subject area that I teach. And so as I do every September, I started this school year with the daunting documents of the curriculum. This is a beautifully laid out biology program of studies that highlights some of the um, really important concepts that I get to teach to kids every year. The simple complexity of the cell, the intricacies of the human body, the power and dynamics of evolution. This is really the to-do list of learning. And I'm responsible to disseminate this information to each of my pupils in one 16-week semester. So as a conscientious teacher, I immediately start packing the picnic lunches. I count up the number of objectives I have to teach. I divide that by the number of days I have. And then I start dividing up that information into neatly wrapped and parceled lunches of information, which I then hand out identically to each of my students day by day as the semester progresses. This is the model of education that we've used for centuries, and for many students, it works just fine. But the picnic system isn't perfect. Trouble begins on the day where the packed lunch contains tuna fish sandwiches. And I've got one kid who doesn't like tuna. And no matter how I try to wrap it nicely and make it seem palatable and exciting, she's not eating it. And so now I've got a problem, because today's lunch has to be tuna because tuna is in the curriculum. Tuna is going to be on the final exam. An equally distressing problem occurs on the day where the packed lunch features fresh and exciting watermelon. Everyone loves this lunch. It's a picnic we all enjoy. It's a great day. <laughs> Except for that kid who was sick that day. And now I'm panicked because I don't have any more picnic lunches this semester that feature watermelon. We've got other foods to get onto, and now I've got to try and find this kid and get him in at lunch for like remedial watermelon sampling outside of the high school curriculum. And this is problematic for today's busy teens and teachers. You can see that a structured and content-heavy curriculum, while full of really meaningful learning objectives, is not without its limitations. The picnic lunch is how we have educated students for almost a century. Now, kids do learn things in my classes. I mean, I, I pack a pretty good picnic. But two years ago, I had an experience that made me stop and ask the question, just what would happen to my students' learning if I stopped packing the lunches? Two years ago, a friend and colleague, Mr. Luke Arvise, invited some students at our school to enter a synthetic biology competition. Now, I majored in biology, had never heard of synthetic biology, so I was curious. If you have no idea what you're looking at right now, you feel the way I did two years ago. This is a picture of an agar plate, sometimes called a petri dish, on which are growing individual bacterial colonies that have been photographed under UV light. This was about to become the obsession of our learning for two years. So to save you the two years of work, here is synthetic biology in a nutshell. You take simple biological systems, often bacteria, reprogram their DNA to turn them into living engineered machines that solve problems or perform useful tasks. Pictured here is an individual bacterium. On the left, in red, is the genomic DNA. Just like our DNA makes us an individual, that red DNA makes that bacterium an individual. It instructs the bacteria to eat and sleep and file tax returns and do whatever else it is bacteria need to do to survive. On the right, in blue, are plasmids. These are extra packets of DNA. They're a bit like the baseball trading cards of the bacterial world. They're shuffled and traded from organism to organism, and they confer such superpowers as antibiotic resistance, for example. It turns out that the lab work needed to put plasmids into bacteria, simple. It's so simple a teenager could do it. 
If you know the genetic sequence of any living thing on this planet that instructs for something cool to happen, you can copy that sequence, package it into a plasmid, duff that plasmid into an unsuspecting bacterium who, not knowing any better, reads those instructions and carries out the function as if it were its own. Synthetic biology. Here's an example from the lab group Amaris. They engineered a yeast cell which could produce the anti-malarial drug artemisinin. Previously very expensive to produce, now being distributed worldwide at a fraction of the cost. A drug being produced by yeast cells that have been reprogrammed into pharmaceutical factories because their DNA has been changed. An example from Cornell University. We took an existing commercial product called mushroom foam and improved it using synthetic biology. This has become a biodegradable and sustainable alternative to polystyrene packing materials. It's made from a re-engineered fungus. My own students chose a very different and a local problem to tackle with synthetic biology. It was inspired by, and I really wish I was making this up, the Epic Poo Race advertisement that was published by the town of Canmore in a local newspaper some years ago. I know, right? It turns out that hair clogs up the pumps and pipes in wastewater treatment facilities. And so it prevents the material from flowing. <clears throat> this is a problem not just in our municipality, but in municipalities around the world. So my kids thought, what if we could engineer a bacterium that could make an enzyme that could break down the hair so then the poop could flow. It was a pretty good idea. And I had no picnic lunches that could teach the kids how to do this. I had no idea how to, how to go about this project. And as a teacher, that's a very scary, scary feeling. I could spend the rest of my time here talking about the cool things we do in the lab and this cutting edge field of science. I could spend my time explaining to you how my students built a functional engineering microbiology lab in our high school for under $10,000 using equipment like a cookie pan, an old record player, a Dremel tool, a thermostat light bulb, and $29 Tupperware container. I could try to encapsulate for you the surreal feeling that I shared with my kids the first time we grew a plate of bacteria that glowed bright red because we had put a gene into them that had never been there before. But I'm told I only have 15 minutes. So, I'm going to come back to my food analogy. How the teaching of synthetic biology required me to totally abandon the paradigm of pre-packing picnic lunches for kids. Instead, I had to step down from the podium, cross the classroom floor, and stand shoulder to shoulder with my kids as we entered the all-you-can-eat buffet of synthetic biology education. There was more food here to be digested, more information to learn, than I could possibly have pre-consumed and then repackaged in neat and tidy bundles for my students. It was impossible. And so instead, we split up. And each of the kids on the team gravitated to a different section of the buffet that they found the most appetizing, to the learning that suit them best. Josh has a knack for technology, so he got involved in the computer and mathematical modeling that was required for our project. He also learned some really basic HTML coding and helped build our website. I have no love for computers, I certainly can't HTML code, but that's okay, because Josh can. Erica, Talia, and Maria became microbiology lab wizards. These girls can genetically manipulate the DNA of bacterial cells that they culture and maintain in a high school laboratory at age 15 and 16. I can't handle a pipette like these kids can, and I certainly don't spend six hours in the lab on Friday afternoons. Alina and Freya presented our work to a crowd of hundreds at an international competition. These are regular teenagers who were given 
an opportunity to direct their own learning, to choose the learning objectives that best fit their own strengths and their own passion and their own taste. But I too learned something, and it's not just about synthetic biology. I learned that when I stop packing picnic lunches for kids, they still learn. They need guidance, and they need direction, and they need encouragement, and they really need time. They need hours and hours of time supported by adults to get lost in the absolute flow of absorbed learning. When I threw away the curriculum and handed over the control of learning objectives to my kids, the learning became more purposeful, more meaningful, authentic. I was honestly afraid that by taking away the mark, taking away the test, I was maybe taking away the motivation for learning because kids study to get good grades, don't they? It turns out what I had removed was the ceiling to how much learning was required of them. And what I found out is that they learned way more than I would have packed for them, and not less. I'll leave you with an update from our team. Maybe we can't teach everything to our young kids using the all-you-can-eat method. But I think it would be a really worthwhile experiment as educators, as parents, as community mentors, to stop packing picnic lunches for kids and encourage them to eat at an all-you-can-eat buffet. To get down from the stage and get into the desks alongside our incredible young people to see what they can really do. So the update. I took this photo from a plane window on our way to Boston because we flew our project to an international synthetic biology competition that originated at MIT. There we participated alongside 250 other teams from almost 40 different countries. And you know what? My six kids from small town Alberta got up on the stage and lost. Their bacteria still doesn't work quite right. They certainly didn't bring home any gold or any glory, but they are gearing up for next year. I have 20 kids signed up for the program this year, not six, because they understand that this project and their learning actually has potential and possibility to change the world. What they have is a whole new appetite for learning. And so in the end, my work with them is done. Thank you.